just to get started from there. So, okay. Anyway, yeah. so we've got here. Okay. And how am I supposed to use this fancy thing? Because I've seen people struggle with this one. Okay, awesome. This is this this should just be the old fashioned forward, forward and back and um, yeah. yourself. Yeah. Uh, now there's two sessions, isn't there? Yes. yes. Um, so how long have we got? An hour. An hour. So yes. about twenty five minutes. So it's going to say, so do you want me to do from the do you want me to do twenty minutes to five minutes? So that should be twenty five minutes for your presentation. Right. Five minutes Q and A. Yes. So twenty minutes I'll do five. Okay. And then I'll do two and then ten more. No, to be honest, it's been great, and that's probably why we've run over apologies for most of them because I think everybody's got really good stuff on. So, thanks very much for coming today. It's just to let you know, um, this session has been recorded, and it's not live, <laughs> to be honest. But I think it's just so that if anybody wants to review and have a look, then they can um, at a later date. And the camera doesn't move, unfortunately, so I have kind of tried to fix it in a sort of a neutral position a little bit. Um, if it does, I can't find the remote control, so apologies for the recording if it doesn't look that great because normally I have been scribbling it about. So I've popped it here, so I've got a slight span there. Anything else, I'll be at the back of the room. Thank you very much. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, we really appreciate your So, first, an overview of the universe of design for learning. UBL is a way of thinking of teaching and learning that helps give us, give all learners an equal opportunity to succeed. It is the why, the what, and the how of learning based on neuroscience research into uh, about learning. This framework helps guide the design and is based on theory, practice, and research with the intention of creating expert a lot of through the messages today to include that comparing our learners is such a big part. It's not about mastering a specific topic, but it's rather it's about learning and mastering the mastering of that um, on a personal level. 
It's about supporting our learners and to learn how to, to know how to learn and to know whatever their particular strengths and weaknesses are. A key value in this approach is recognizing learner variability. And by this, we recognize that and realize all learners are unique. Uh, Dr. Todd Rose has an excellent said talk that uh, if you're unfamiliar about the myth of average, I encourage you to do it. Uh, he really talks and presents it in a reasonable fashion, which makes sense. Uh, it's included in the references. The UBL approach offers flexibilities in the way learners access materials and engage with it and show what they know. And it's about providing options and reducing barriers. Developing lesson plans this way helps all learners, although it may be especially helpful to learners with learning and thinking differences. Um, intentionally building that flexibility right at the get-go is in the design of the learning environment, as well as adding in supports and scaffolds to support this journey. Important, the long-established educational model of knowledge transfer as one directional is, is certainly ingrained in our traditional Spaces. I've heard lots in through the conflicts so people chat with me challenge that as well. This traditional approach is often is challenged in this thinking and yet research is identifying this as a good thing. I think we've also heard lots of support and seem to be in that consensus. Um, UDL and open approaches look to shift the support of the 21st needs, 21st century needs for lifelong learning and knowledge built instruction in these dynamic times. And the UBL framework is based on three principles. Engagement, which is the why of learning. This is the effective uh, neural network and is often realized, is, is now realized to be a very strong influencer. In, on the success, your learners need to want to learn and to be motivated. And this is where interest, effort, and persistence are acted upon. Planning and designing for your audience engagement just helps create that positive learning space. Representation is the what of learning, and it, this is the recognition of the neural network, um, and is making sense of the patterns around us for learning. Uh, providing information in various formats, such as video, uh, podcast, print, infographics, are all some of the ways that information can be presented and help learners uh, to, to make the connections to ideas. Action and expression is the how of learning, and it's it's the actions that build our understanding and enable us to uh, become strategic in our learning actions and to, uh, is based on sort of the strategic neural network. Uh, and this can be things like providing different ways uh, for learners to demonstrate their learning. Uh, a lot of what open leads to is, is exactly that, and this is sort of where we feel it's UDL provides us scaffolding to set the learners up to um, an example can be use of one example that I've seen very effective um, is using origami to represent mathematical constructs and concepts, and it's very popular. Origami. Origami. I did. I did the same. The same expression actually taught. Um, a university professor I worked with for years. She has brought that into a class. And Sides and if you look at origami, it's very, very structured, um, and it's been very effective for just a different way to approach things. So this is the UBL guidelines, and they're presented in a in a simple, fairly easy to read grid. Um, this grid illustrates the three key principles in columns, and each they use the color coding to make a little bit sort of the visual, um, and the rows are detailing the progression. What's interesting is that the progression goes downwards versus upward. Um, so the green, the, um, the top of the row lists the title of the principal. Um, the bottom lists the goal that you're striving for. And then the pathway in between is sort of showing uh, steps and they're color coded. The green is for the principle of engagement, which is is becoming more recognized as being highly valued. Um, there isn't a weighting between these though. The blue is the purple is for the representation, and the blue is for the action and expression. 
And if you're looking for the physical representation of what's happening, the little picture image of the brain across the top tells you the areas that this is being affected when you're talking about those particular elements of UDL. Um, the rows between show these progression from the external to the internal, because ultimately learning is a very internal, individualistic, uh, individual thing. And this is sort of the progression through. And this is really about a way of, of thinking of learning to enable all learners and opportunities to succeed. And it strives to reduce the barriers by recognizing supporting the uniqueness of individuals and their ways of knowing. These differences can be language differences, they can be cultural differences, and they can be requir requiring accommodations for sound or visual or various other challenges. This approach gives the flex flexibility in your proactively designing to include those and in the ways that the learners would maybe give a choice and voice to access materials to engage with what it is and show what they know. Um, it's also a framework that can be understood at a glance. It's a high level where it's sort of just the three, the three principles. You can continue to go down. As you can see, there's more points within the, um, each of those uh, cells. And you can continue behind those. There's a lot more. So you can go into it deeper. A lot of times people start at a very light level, just sort of just giving some consideration to each of the three principles. And the real key is that you consider learner choice and learner voice. So UDL supports learner development towards enabling open pedagogy. By returning, you know, just returning to the guidelines and looking at the structure, these levels are sort of the external, uh, which is the access, and this is, and then it's the supporting build, and then the process to internalize, which is, uh, which progress towards the development of the expert learner, which is really the goal of using UDL, is you're fundamentally trying to help you set your learners up for success. Um, and that supports the next step of the idea of open pedagogy, where learners co-create knowledge and contribute in particular to the realm of higher education. As the UDL principle of engagement relates to the emotional element, um, the opportunity through open pedagogy active activities to create new knowledge and to share broadly provides learners a voice, which is very important and creates, uh, a, it's a powerful one and helps to build the confidence and self um, uh, which is where we're sort of seeing it as a, as a foundation as a scaffolding to help support students towards open pedagogy. Uh, what you know really does matter. Previous in, in, in experiences do drive interest and engagement and perception, uh, attention and goals and actions, and recognizing the variability in learner background, uh, knowledge, and experience is important. Valuing this uniqueness empowers learners to have use their strength, focus on their challenges, and motivate their own learning experiences. When they are these expert learners, they get to be in the driver's seat. And open pedagogy builds on the UDL to foster student agency to be co-constructed in new, new knowledge and means to build student engagement. Higher ed tradition looks at the early years in university and college as sort of a rites of pa passage, a gatekeeping, and it's sort of heard a bit more or a bit more along these lines this morning. But why does learning have to be competitive and one over another? Um, if the benefit to society is to have a more educated thinking, then why are we planning for attrition and not planning for focusing on um, more understanding can be possible for university students. It doesn't make sense for them, So just kind of building on what Carolee's spoken about so far, that it's important that we give our students opportunities. And this is throughout Bonnie's talk, it's important to scaffold that along the way. Um, give them opportunities to build on their skills, so that when it comes to the creation of OERs, um, they had they had an opportunity to, as one of the earlier ones um, to build up those skills and then they can develop and co-create um, educational resources um, 
and share that knowledge out there. So it's really about building up those steps to create resources. And we'll get more into that in just a moment. So sort of as we go forward and to understand it a bit more of sort of what is what is UDL and what it is not. Um, interesting I heard in the previous session some refer to UDL as sort of a digital uh, phase and that was how I was introduced to UDL initially as it was this technology tool. As I started exploring and getting much deeper into it, it was much more than a digital technology tool. You will also technology affords giving multiple ways, but it is not the only way. Uh, it is not built on technology. Um, so that's one of the, the biggest things. So it's not um, not only technology. It's uh, the universal, the word universal can throw you off and sort of sound like UDL is about one way to approach to teach everyone, but UDL actually takes an opposite approach. It's about giving each person, it's about giving points. Um, the goal of UDL is to use a variety of instructional methods to remove the barriers and to, to learning, and it's about to give all learners equal opportunities to succeed. This can be language, this can be culture, this can be um, marginalization, uh, oppression, marginalization, accessibility. It's about building in the flexibility uh, that can be adjusted to every learner's strengths and needs. And this is why you feel benefits everyone. Variability among students can also happen within different contexts. Um, so a student might prefer, a, you know, a, a music student might thrive in the music classroom, but struggles when, uh, and thrive when they're presenting music, but then struggle when they're uh, presenting in the classroom um, for marketing. So UDL emerged as a framework uh, to, to look at facilitating learning, considering that all learners have different needs. And it's about removing the barriers and not just the accommodations to providing, um, designing to the margins. It provides access to approaches that are used by majority. An example of this is Closed captioning was initially designed for hearing impairment, and yet it is estimated to be used by more, more by partners in uh, the watching the TV to keep volume down than it is to be being used by hearing impairment. So it's it's you know, a lot of times things are designed for specific design for margins, but it actually serves in the group. And by making it available in the groups of how UDL came to be was about providing accommodations to um, for students, and they quickly realized uh, back in the 80s that when they made accommodations for certain students, that if they needed available to all the students, they needed the students who did not need accommodations in the traditional sense, actually the use of resources. Uh, and that's what led to the creation of, of EPL. Um, the predictable area, one thing that is predictable is that you have learner variability, and this is what's led to the, the whole UDL, knowing that you're going to have a variety of people. Um, designing these margins better serves the majority, and its simplest explanation, UDL is about providing multiple ways to learning to allow learners to select the path they wish. It's not a checklist, more technology based, as I said, um, although technology does help provide multiple ways, and it does make it much easier for us now than, than 20 years ago. Um, but it is, and it is a powerful tool, but that's, it should be for the it should be allowing uh, adaptation as necessary, and it is not going to be necessary. The understanding of how learners uh, differ help to consider the very different diversity of opportunities, and can assist in reaching certain many of the learners. Um, it sounds daunting, but I think you can start with sort of one small step. Um, every iteration, no class curriculum, no class structure should ever be rigid. It's always should be flexible and open as we learn and as we get uh, more resources available. How to get there? Um, I think some of the big things of how UDL fits in with that uh, open education with pedagogy, it provides a foundation for recognizing all learners are unique and they proactive, uh, proactively give up the designing for learner variability. Um, this concept of design can be expanded 
by using materials that are accessible through um, format and the cost of learners and by any cost is a big barrier and that's one of the things that I think open brings over the law is reducing that cost. Um, and through the selection of activities that enable learners to bring their voice to the learning space and often by providing the choice we see that they can like to go. Um, with UDL we begin with clear goals and make sure that their goals are presented um, so the learners can proceed to understand them well. Uh, try to keep the goals separate from the means so where possible for the such as writing a report, what is it that you're going to think of the top of the report? Um, often, if it's demonstrating the grasp of a, a, a difficult topic, writing could actually pretty much show us that we know what that means, but not disadvantage others, that writing is a strength. So, in a reasonable manner, writing for it, not looking at this one, in a course that seems to be a more narrow topic, that may not be the most useful solution in giving. To your groups to demonstrate in the need to help. Um, and it's about providing options to develop the ideas in different ways. So, if the course is, say, it's a writing course, sometimes helping with mind map and things like that, help learners who don't are struggle with the writing aspect, um, help them get to it in ways that they're cooperating. Uh, seek to include options and include in something in each of the neural networks. And ensure those goals don't have to be great ones embedded in them. Um, and that can be marking for spreading style when it was first and it's going to be very clear on what those goals are. Um, materials and methods, ensure flexible materials are um, available for learners. Materials can be media or tool sharing information um, with learners. It can also be letting the students select what they want. Um, we include digital technologies such as a glossary that is hyperlinked between the materials on the online video. It could be shared as a, as a whiteboard, it could be varied, and it should just be flexible, allowing them progressing towards the goal, and then um, ensure that the flexible methods are available. And when possible, include the thank you, um, flexible options, assessment options. Writing is the intentionally um, goal, then find other ways to assess, like let them have choice. Um, we've had I've had success in some of the classes that you know, just doing something and choose a variety of different ways to present things and have some very nice podcasts, we have some, some great videos and such. Um, it's about taking the black approach. Alright. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about some of the ways that we then bridge it over to open pedagogy. Um, and when I'm talking about open pedagogy, I'm talking about how we can involve our students in the process of knowledge co-creation or democratize um, the process of teaching and learning. Um, so first I'll kind of get a bit more into, oops, um, what is open pedagogy? Like what do, what do I mean when I'm talking about it? And this is what I really um, value about open pedagogy. So, um, I think it's a broad concept and we talk about it in many different ways. What I'm drawing on is the tradition of critical pedagogy as we talk about it through the works of Hooks and Frere. Um, and it encompasses a, uh, encompasses a range of pedagogical practices and what foundational values right? Talk about the importance of values. Um, values of access and equity, community and connection, agency, ownership, and risk and responsibility mm -hmm. for and consistent. Um, so the concept of open pedagogy, it's talked about it's understood in different ways, um, but it's an access-oriented commitment to learner-driven education, and as a process of um, designing architectures and using tools that enable students to shape public knowledge comments so which are part of that's part of um, Rosa and Giampiani. So um, building on that, when we think about um, the critical aspect of critical pedagogy, as an instructor when I'm designing my courses, one thing that I'm thinking about is when we're bridging it to UDL, what stands out is the need to develop a critical consciousness as well. Um, and that's almost a first step. So when we're, we're doing the scaffolding to build those, those skills, um, critical consciousness is, is that awareness of inequities in our socio-critical context. So students can start to recognize those patterns that are there. 
and then you can go to the next step with that co-creation. So this is just something that I thought about as sort of I was thinking through, um, this is something I did over the summer, as I was kind of thinking about what does open pedagogy mean to me. Um, and this shifts and changes over time. It's, it's uh, I don't know, it's, it was just to help me think about my courses and what am I trying to do. So I want to bring in this critical pedagogy, this critical conscious and praxis, build those two, and I hope my students, that we become empowered to create shifts and changes. Bringing in open pedagogy is so important to me through that. Um, here I've put up some foundations of Jedi that are foundational to my work. And then I really try to build upon that we're aiming towards epistemic and social justice. And um, that's informed by the work of Fricker and Sarah Lambert there and her work. So I'm trying to bring that forward um, as, I, as I'm thinking about sort of what are my, my goals and values in this and how can I help my students um, to sort of think through this. So one of the things that comes up is, does OEP assume learner readiness, um, and is that reasonable? So oftentimes in courses where, and I, I have to say, I've well, kind of say, hey, let's create these um, open educational resources and embed it through pedagogy. Sometimes my students are like, what are you asking us to do, right? Whether I'm an undergraduate or graduate level, it's kind of like, you know, we're not used to this level of freedom. And that's where it's really important, Carly, but to you know, make sure that scaffolding and build those skills. Um, and unfortunately, I don't have time, but um, this was another presentation that we had, and two of our students talked about. Um, their experiences, like what does it mean when you have learner-driven practices? So with Erica and Sharmila here, and Erica talks about how actually her educational experience wasn't really good. She even said like hated school, right? Um, and she talks about how through being allowed the affordances to sort of co-create um, knowledge and in um, learning materials, how she began to love school again, that mobility. Shermilla talks about how finally my voice was heard, like it mattered. Um, and so these are just some things to think about as our time is up, and we will post next steps. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 Helps create that and build a better bridge and better transition in between those uh, Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I, to be honest with you, the title intrigued me because I was wondering how are we going to bridge UDL and health pedagogy? So I think that was a lot of things I'm going to later. Um, I thought one of the, the slides you said before, well, it's not, I, I think it is good teaching some of my colleagues with the UDL principles, and I agree. Um, one thing I, I might humbly suggest it, but it's not as well. So, disability, when I introduce mm -hmm. you, you have to go, ah, yeah, that's disability, or so, you know, I think that's one of the, and, uh, as you said, it started off with accommodations. Yeah. Of, it's, you have to go to zone. It's something to do with anybody else in the right, and by the way, I watch Netflix, I, I have the cloud captions of the bad guy, but that was well done, I'll, I'll chat again later. Yeah. 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 Okay, great. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Josh Bolick, and um, this session you have it in front of you. More than a textbook, librarianship is a case study for building a community and opening a discipline. I think I'm going to follow Sarita's read. Uh, we try to use my notes, but we'll see if that if that gets confusing. So um, I am speaking on behalf of this is my main collaboration team. Maria Bond is an associate professor and uh, uh, director of the Library School at Urbana Champaign at the University of Illinois. Um, Will Cross is speaking in that room right there. I think it's the 
fourth time he's presented here, so you've probably all seen them. We tried to, uh, we wrote, and we're like, hey, can we like ship things? And they were like, no, you maniacs, like, uh, don't present it four times. And so, the, um, I, yeah, that's very understandable. Uh, but Will's at North Carolina State University, where he's the director of the Open Knowledge Center. Um, my name is Josh Bullock, and I'm the head of the David Schulenberger Office of Scholarly Communication and Copyright at the University of Kansas Libraries. Um, so the sort of background of this presentation and the work that I'm going to present is that librarians and libraries have been essential, I think it's safe to say, to the growth of open education. Um, and yet, formal instruction about open education in library and information studies, masters in library schools, that sort of thing, um, is pretty uncommon. Um, there's a lack of open educational resources and practices for training LIS students, um, but LIS students and instruction can benefit from open education for the exact same reasons that it can in every other discipline, um, like textbooks in librarianship are not magically inexpensive or free or modifiable but so open education has a role to play here um, and practitioners are underrepresented in LIS instruction there's this gap um, that even like the Institute for Museum and Library Services has recognized that um, the Association of Library and Information Science Educators um, conference this fall uh, their theme that's selected this year is bridging the gap between practice and uh, teaching and so we looked at this and see an opportunity in it. Um, and so um, our collaboration, you see there the header of our website, OER plus Skullcom, our project site, um, is born from the realization that scholarly communication topics, including open education, are of increasing importance and have been under addressed in LIS education. Um, by the way, there's a link here, uh, tinyurl.com slash OER23SEN. It's on the last slide also. I'll tweet it and we'll post the slides to our website. Um, so um, the core idea that we gathered around, I was uh, uh, at the Open Education Network Summer Institute, I think in summer 2016, and um, said librarians should be making open educational resources for ourselves. And so um, that initial concept was an open textbook that for the training of scholarly communication librarians. And not necessarily with that title, but many, many people within academic libraries are working on those topics. So like, like digital publishing librarians, um, you know, acquisitions librarians are now front and center in the open access movement. Uh, we all deal with copyright in some capacity. Um, and so that was just sort of the original design. Um, my colleague Will, obviously being the go-getter, said, um, let's see if we can get some funding from the Institute for Museum and Library Services, that's our federal funder in the US, um, to do some research and have a convening and see if we can learn more about the design of that to make it as useful as possible. And so we did that. They incredibly gave us about $50,000 um, to uh, pursue that research and to host a convening. Um, and we published this article in the Journal of Librarianship and Scholarly Communication um, in, I think, mid-2020. Um, and so it's called Find Their Way, a Snapshot of Scholarly Communication Practitioners, Duties, and Training. And what we found, not to our surprise, is that most of the people doing this work aren't uh, getting much training on it in library schools, and they're doing a lot of that learning on the job, which uh, uh, we all learn on the job, and that's really reasonable. But as the profession is shifting in these directions, I think it's, under, it's reasonable to desire that our educations adjust to uh, support that. Um, so the book uh, is currently with ACRL. We're supposed to get Redline edits back in May. Um, so we're expecting it at the end of this year to be published under a Creative Commons uh, attribution non-commercial license. Um, part one of it, the three of us wrote, it's about what is scholarly communication and what is scholarly communication librarianship and what are the social, economic, technical, and legal and policy issues that fundamentally shape that work. Part two is an introduction to open access, uh, to open education, to open data, and to open science and infrastructure. And each of those sections have an expert subject editor who selected contributors of their choosing to sort of shape those chapters based on their, or sections based on their, their expertise in those areas. And then part three was, um, called Voices from the Field. We did a CFP. We got about 50 submissions. We selected about 26 of them. Um, they're short pieces that are like 
varying perspectives on different issues in, that are relevant to scholarly communication, intersection of scholarly communication with other areas of academic librarianship, um, and case studies that are relevant. So the book has over 70 contributors, and that has, that's a lot of, and if I had to do it again, I might not have quite that many people involved. They're all wonderful, and I'm so grateful to all of them. We are so grateful to all of them, but it's been a lot to, to manage, and that's made that project. I think we were initially thinking, like, we can get this done in a couple years, but uh, like six years later, we're finally getting close to publication. Um, we went back to IMLS, um, and that built on that initial planning grant, um, requested more funding because one of the things that we realized is that a book is, uh, books are linear. There's only so many people that can contribute to it, even when we try really hard to include as many perspectives as possible. They're hierarchical, they're static. Our work is not those things. Um, and so one of the things that we realized was that um, to counter those limitations of a book, even an open one, that we needed a, some sort of companion platform. And so based on the pedagogy notebook, as a model, um, we called our platform the Scholarly Communication Notebook. We settled on OER Commons. Um, they have this, diff they have a hub designation. Um, so we have a hub in the OER Commons. Um, link to it there. Uh, we got a fancy uh, logo designed. Um, there's a link to our grant material, or to the grant, and I think all our materials are online. Um, this has these, there's seven collections. The What, Why Scholarly Communication collection is just off screen there, but that's like things that aren't scoped to these particular topics. But they're open access, copyright, scholarly sharing, open education, data, and impact measurement. Um, there are about 150 unique resources that are currently here, because uh, some things understandably go in more than one category. Um, these folks we hired isn't the right word, but they, they did get paid. Um, we worked with them to try to, again, spread, like not have our, ourselves overrepresented in the work and to um, have leverage these folks' expertise to find openly licensed content that was appropriate for teaching about and learning about scholarly communication topics. And so Regina Gong, does anyone, who knows Regina? Yeah, Regina is amazing uh, and um, she, has left the Michigan State University and is now at the University of San Diego, I believe. Um, Rachel Miles is an impact librarian at Virginia Tech. Hua Luong is a data services librarian at Urbana-Champaign. Sarah Vinson is a copyright librarian at Urbana-Champaign. Um, AJ Boston, scholarly communication librarian at Murray State University in Kentucky. If you're not following AJ on Twitter and you're still on Twitter, I understand. If you don't want to be on Twitter anymore, but you really should. He's like the bright light. On, that, on Twitter, very funny, very insightful. Um, and Jill Saracella works on open access at CUNY, the graduate center. Um, we also commissioned directly the creation of works through three calls of, for proposals. Um, there are about 35 of them. This is just a short list, so Intro to Open Education by Sarah Hare and Ali Versus, who's floating around here somewhere. Um, Skullcom 20, uh, 20X by Stuart Baker is an interactive fictional game in the very near future, sort of day in the life, confronts uh, the player with uh, different situations that we encounter uh, in, our, in our professions and um, sort of presents choices and you have to deal with those choices. Um, Trans Inclusion in Open Educational Resources by Kat Clement and Steven Kruger. Um, Altmetrics Bingo uses Bingo as a concept, as a game to play for learning about all metrics and different scholarly metrics. Um, introduction to Bibliodiversity in Scholarly Communication by Allison Kittinger and Jennifer Solomon talked about injecting more bibliodiversity and uh, embracing that bibliodiversity in the scholarly publishing system. Here's a few more accessibility case studies by Talia Anderson. Um, pow, pow, excuse me, power, Profit, and Privilege, Problematizing Scholarly Publishing by Amanda Macula. Um, and peer review, a critical primer and practical course. So like, these resources are scoped to fundamentally learning about these topics that are of vital interest within scholarly communication. And suitable for teaching librarians, but also suitable for teaching like graduate students or undergraduates in many fields that are engaged in the scholarly publishing, right? Or peer review, or accessibility. Um, so there's some curricular integration already. Um, 
the Skullcon 2020X game, my colleague Maria, who teaches a course on scholarly communication at Urbana-Champaign, uh, used that as a pre and a post test and observed that the students um, in the post test, they weren't graded on it, but um, as an exercise, um, demonstrated greater familiarity and comfort with those complex topics. Um, they played altmetric bingo, and um, there was a cheers when uh, one of their UIUC professors um, was sufficient, had all of the sort of metrics to fill in the bingo card. Um, we also have a project where Chris Hollister, who's a librarian at the University of Buffalo, had students through open pedagogy um, create chapters in books on topics of their selection and interest on issues in scholarly publishing or open access. Um, we've come across anecdotally other folks that like at conferences that are like, hey, I'm using your stuff, uh, but like we haven't been able to track that very well. Um, but so we have a lot more work to do, but we're starting to see this stuff get use. Um, we published an article in November in the College and Research Library News, it's an ACRL um, publication, sort of introducing the scholarly communication notebook, so more to learn there. Um, we experimented with these creation workshops, the idea being like we all have skills and knowledge that we can share, and we're often sitting on piles of resources, handouts, slides, et cetera, that we can make them discoverable and put them online and put an open license on them. That's how we are. Um, and so that's the learning objectives that we use for the ACRL 2018 pre-conference. Um, you know, identify a problem, develop a methods for articulating and addressing that problem, uh, creating a resource that reflects the unique expertise of the author, and then understanding how to make it open and where to put it. Um, positive uh, that we educated people about OER and open licensing. Um, we shared information about our project. We built positive networking that came from that, um, and we got some good feedback. But where we imagined that people might, in a single session or a single day, create open learning objects, license them, license them, deposit them, and then share them with us for deposit in the scholarly communication notebook, that hasn't really worked. Um, so, I don't know if that's like too ambitious or we need to adjust our approach or what, but um, nonetheless, that, that, we don't think of that as a loss. Um, so, kind of starting to pull this all together, you know, this is, I've been focused on content, but community has been so fundamental, um, and that's come up again and again at this conference, right? We hear about like, um, the benefit of being with each other, learning with each other, um, and thinking about the needs of, of other people. So we hosted the symposium in 2018 at North Carolina State University with about 40 people. We've been to many, many other conferences and had many conversations at those conferences with folks like you who have, have provided helpful feedback. Um, there's the 70 plus book contributors, the six curators in the SCN, the, those resources that, the 35 resources have about 50 creators. Um, we've got about 10 instructors that we've been in touch with who are in a position to adopt to this stuff, and some of them are planning to do so. Um, we've had funding from the Institute for Museum and Library Services, the support and community of the Open Education Network, um, the support and community of the Scholarly Publishing and Academic Resources Co Coalition, um, and the support of ACRL. When we went to ACRL and said, we would like a somewhat conventional publisher for the book because Library school professors are, in some ways, a lot more like uh, any other academic department on a university than they are like librarians, and we wanted them to go like, oh, like, we can take this seriously. Um, I expected to have to fight for the openness of it as a fundamental concept, and they were just like, yeah, cool. Um, so I think that says a lot about um, our society's support for open access. Um, we've also sought to provide as broad representation of identity, uh, perspective, institutional types, um, regions, admittedly within the US, a little bit in Canada, and a little bit in South America, but like that's where we currently are, so I think that makes sense, but global perspectives are very welcome. Um, and there's lots of different kinds of, there's games, there's videos, there's slides, there's books, there's all kinds of different formats that are present. Um, so, um, we thought of this as like, what, what can we learn from this experience? We are still learning and will be, uh, I think, in perpetuity. Um, and so this is the sort of, I was working on these last night, jet lag, um, and um, sort of thinking about, well, what did we learn? So it's, it's great work to do. It's a privilege to be able to do it, um, but it's a ton of work. Like it's, it's a lot of work, and this is on top of our uh, main jobs. Um, and like speaking for myself, I feel a significant weight of responsibility. There's a lot of lost 
sleep over the past few years where I worry and I mean about who am I disappointing, who have I let down, who have I not responded to, um, is this presentation any good, will the book be successful, like all kinds of worries and uh, that's new to me. I don't, I don't know what's going on there, but I think finding myself in a leadership position at the head of this community in some ways, um, I take that responsibility seriously, we do. Um, we've sought to share as much as possible, and I, I think that's sort of a, that's baked into the ethos of this work, um, to occupy humility, uh, to invite feedback, including critical feedback, and to consider and listen to that feedback and look for ways like feedback, if, critical feedback can be offered in the spirit of generosity, and so assuming the group of people who are offering that feedback. Um, thinking about the keynote talk yesterday, um, you know, in, like, even in the regular world, not necessarily in a grim dark world, um, failure happens, right? Like things don't work out. Sometimes timing doesn't work, right? Um, we run up against bureaucracy. Like, we work in complex organizations that have policies and law and uh, lawyers and there's rights issues and all kinds of things that we've had to navigate, um, but ultimately we've been able to do that. But like the last few years, I think in particular, have been what the keynote speaker called a grimdark world. And we can think about political crises, social crises, uh, climate change, health, right? There's all kinds of difficult things that we've been living through and enduring together. And so as a response to that, we just sought to extend maximum grace and understanding if somebody needs more time to finish a project. They get it. Our editor for the ACRL has been incredibly patient. Um, with giving us time and understanding that all of our lives have been heavily disrupted. Um, and so we've just like sought to extend that grace back to all of our other contributors and to um, continue moving forward and pivoting where necessary. Um, so in order to get to the preferable future of broad open education uh, adoption within a discipline, the theme of this conference is advancing open education. Um, and to be clear, I don't think we're the only ones doing this. We're not the only discipline doing this. Um, there's a, a lot to be learned from all kinds of corners, um, but this is kind of where what we realized that like, yes, it requires content and practices, um, but the most important thing is people. Like without any, um, this isn't an attack on the keynote speaker. There was a lot of really interesting ideas that were presented there and they were complicated, but like we're not making OER for these we are making OER for people and collaborating with people in order to cultivate content that is usable and open and accessible for people to use, right? And um, so that, that's sort of where we are um, on the ground. We need space and time to experiment and to fail and to learn, um, and we need to build bridges across gaps. The big gap that still exists for us, I think, is between um, our work and LIS instructors. Um, you would think that those worlds wouldn't be so far apart, but in some ways they are. Luckily, we have Maria, uh, who is a, a library and information studies professor. Um, it's core to our collaboration. There has been some pushback. Um, nobody necessarily likes being told that um, they're not doing something right, but we, I mean, and that's not exactly, that's not where we're coming from, per se. Um, we're saying there's some issues, you have expertise, we have expertise, we can meet in the middle and better prepare future librarians. Um, language instruction is a, a great uh, example of a disciplinary community that has really broadly embraced uh, open education. Uh, there's so much energy and energy there, and so like, a lot to learn from those folks. Um, we are currently wrapping up the scholarly communication notebook grant, but the work of supporting it and growing it will continue. We're expecting edits on the open textbook, the scholarly communication librarianship um, in early May. That's going to be summer work. Uh, publication towards the end of the year. Um, we just submitted another IMLS grant for greater engagement with the library instruction community because that's where we really need to get those, those folks are in a position to adopt this content and to adapt it and implement it. Um, we're thinking about LISD degrees and like whether something a zero textbook cost um, pathway to get a graduate degree in library and information studies, um, what an opportunity that might be and what that would look like. Um, and then there's all this open access scholarly content that with a, you know the definition of open access, the definition of open educational resources, 
there's a Venn diagram there, but a lot of that can be cultivated to be more useful in the classroom. And so what the enrichment of that content might look like. Um, part of the article in CNRL News is about how this content can be useful to practitioners. It's not merely for LIS and professors and uh, students, but like um, a lot of this stuff is made by us as a community and useful either for your own professional development or for supporting your own instruction. Um, and then if you have stuff that uh, would be appropriate for sharing, there's a post on our website about how to add content to the scholarly communication workflow. Um, it takes 15 minutes to add something, it's pretty user friendly. Um, and so uh, uh, like anything in scope is, is welcome. Um, so in closing, um, we think LIS is right for thinking and acting programmatically about discipline-wide OER adoption and that there are lessons learned in that for other communities, both within, like, so I've been focused on scholarly communication areas, but they could, this applies to acquisitions or to uh, any other area that, of uh, librarianship and other disciplines altogether. So um, we'd love to get it, to hear from you. We're on Twitter for now. <laughs> Um, we have the project site. My email is jbolick at ku.edu. These slides are online. Again, they will go on the website and I'll tweet them. Um, and I'd love to hear your questions. Yes. Thanks so much. That's uh, uh, quite interesting. Uh, and uh, in, in the point of um, trying to content, yeah? um, do you sometimes, by bringing together those in practice and those in the academia, do you sometimes reach a point where you find that some divided views uh, as far as uh, what the practitioner uh, believes in and what the academia believes in, and how do you navigate around that? Because I, I, I find this the same in my country as a librarian who is practicing and the one in the academia. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, like, we are not very deep into that community. Like, we, you know, we kind of know the short list of people who have been teaching, like, overtly on these topics. And because they're teaching uh, about open educational resources or about scholarly communication and open access, they, they have been pretty receptive. Um, we, we think that parts of the book and certainly things that are in the scholarly communication notebook you know, the whole idea is to be able to say, well, I'm teaching an information policy course. We spent a month talking about copyright, so I'll, I'll grab some content about copyright and, focus, and, and use that, but don't need to adopt the entire book. Um, so, you know, there's a long history of critique from a librarianship of like, you haven't taught us this thing. And we, in some ways, are participating in that. Um, but, I mean, I think. I try to, again, extend grace and understanding that like they're coming from their own contexts um, and experiences. Um, you know, I lead the, or I so recently led the open education programs at my institution, um, and there's just enough people to work with that if somebody says, not for me, I that's fine. Uh, and I, I actually don't have time to bash my head against the wall trying to convince them. Um, they'll either come around or they won't. Uh, and, you know, there's room for diversity of perspective. Um, I would, um, if we can have, like, there's <laughs> there's one strong personality that looked like screamed at us on Twitter, um, and I, there's nothing to be gained from screaming back. Um, so, um, but, like, where a conversation can be had about what we're missing, um, what we're not recognizing, um, or if we could collaborate together to get across that, I would be happy to lean into that conversation. But like, we're busy, they're busy, you know, everybody's busy. So like, I think that's why we need an additional grant to be able to go to those places and say we have funding um, to support recognizing that it's labor to investigate these materials and these this content and potentially adopting it. Um, so are there ways that we can support So I, I, don't, I don't know that there's like a magic equivalent there, um, except to listen and be open and um, try to understand where they're coming from too and take those concerns.
this previously, um, and see if we can find a way. Like, in my experience, often the people who are most critical of open educational resources, like they're wrestling with it, and that's their way of understanding it. And those folks can also become great advocates. And so I would just look to not uh, to not. So, like early career librarians or the people who are teaching? Oh, the, the early career librarians. Yeah. I think it's it's shifting. Like, certainly when I finished my degree in 2013 and started working in the scholarly communication office, I had never. Given, uh, I don't think I ever had the phrase with Maybe two weeks on copyright and information policy course, and nothing else that was relevant. Um, and so, uh, I would have said a decade ago, very few people. But like, um, we have slowly been turning up additional courses, topics on scholarly communication. Um, Stephen Bell from Temple teaches a course at San Jose on open education resources. <coughs> Chris Hollister at Buffalo teaches a course on scholarly communication. So like, there are more and more people who are coming into the profession um, with some knowledge about these things. And I don't think, like, we're not arguing that every library school, every student needs to be exposed to certain these things. I think it's potential utility for everyone who's going to academic librarianship. But maybe less so for public librarianship or school librarianship or special librarianship. You know, archives, copyright, matters. Um, so, you know, I can make a broad pitch that applies across the academy. You know, that's another, that, like, public libraries would be an audience that we haven't had as much engagement with, but maybe it would be an interesting one to talk to. I think there's certainly support for open educational resources, the role that they can play in supporting students and others in public libraries. But I think it's shifting, but, like, I think I was one of 700 students in my program at a given time. Um, and master's students um, in library schools like pay for books for the program and the PhDs. Um, and so um, it's not our goal that everyone comes out and with the knowledge. And it's not our goal to make them all experts and turn them all into scholarly communication librarians. I think mean, we, we talk about um, uh, literacy instead of um, being able to go, like, ah, oh, there's a new guide about, there's some resources online. Oh no, I've been tasked with giving a presentation or a sign a department. And somebody wants to know what the publication contract says. Is there, a, is there a way for me to learn about that quickly? Um, and it's just really good. So it's, it's getting better, but um, there's a, a lot of um, you know, kind of things that I, we're, we've been hiring. In my life, it required 10 faculty positions in the last year after a uh, period of not hiring anyone and loss of positions. Kansas uh, in the United States is not known for its support for uh, public education, and so there have been budget crises before the pandemic um, and hiring increases and stuff like that. Um, and a lot of these new librarians, when I um, have a chance to chat with them, I take everybody to move to my institution out of the um, and um, just talk. Um, and they're like, what do you do? And I have, I don't know. Uh, but I think outside of the mailroom, everyone in an academic library is, is some way replacing 
with or in service to the scholarly communication. We are facilitating access to content to support research and teaching, and these issues are Thank you all. <laughs> so now I think we can give a short break uh, for um, Adela. We can do it for the last session for yourselves. Uh,